Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Simon and I spoke to journalist and author Andrew Hankinson live from the Well Told Festival. Very interesting interview that we did at a very interesting conference slash festival at Goldsmiths College in South London. We spoke to Andrew about his career, his entry to the world of men's magazines and becoming disillusioned with that Milo, and then his book-length project writing about Raoul Moat, the murderer who sprung to prominence in 2010. We hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for, for coming down. So Ellie and I co-host the podcast Always Take Notes, which has been running for two years now. Uh, it's about writing in, in the broadest sense. So we talk to all sorts of people, to writers of all stripes, from military historians to romance novelists, also to editors, agents, publishers, things like that. Uh, it comes out uh, every two weeks. You can see our website is here and we're on iTunes and all the available technology. Um, and we're delighted to be here with Andrew to do our uh, live session. So but a quick background on, on Andrew, if you don't mind me speaking about you in sure. third person. So Andrew is a journalist. He's written for The Observer, The Guardian, Wired. Um, he came in through the magazines, magazine industry, uh, through FHM and Arena. Um, but most notably, uh, he wrote this book, which is You Could Do Something Amazing With Your Life, which is um, fascinating retelling of the killer Raoul Moat's final eight days, I think it was, yeah. before he was before he killed himself and it's all about his standoff with the Northumbrian police after he killed his girlfriend and her new partner, his ex-girlfriend and her new partner. Um, and it's in the second person, uh, so uh, it's a very interesting read. Uh, so, but before we get to that, let's back up a little bit, Andrew, and um, go back to how you started in the industry. Uh, I know that you studied business uh, and computing, Yeah, it, Yeah, did business and IT at Manchester Metropolitan, and uh, and I didn't do very well at that, and it wasn't a particularly good course or anything, so um, after that I was working in a call centre in Newcastle, and uh, after about a year of that I realised it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. And so. it's Ricky Gervais, I think, a <laughs> quote from Ricky Gervais that yeah, saved you. Yeah, so I wrote about that for The Guardian. The, um, yeah, it was basically, it was a quote from Ricky Gervais just saying, you know, don't spend your whole life doing something you don't want to do uh, and then retire at 60 whatever and, and kind of that's the end of your life so I thought that kind of struck me at the right time so I quit this job in a call centre and went to teach English in South Korea a place called Daegu and uh, did that for a few months and while I was over there I kind of wrote in that Guardian piece as well I read these books by uh, Toby Young and Andrew Neal <laughs> and all these people who, who are a bit quite inflammatory now for a lot of people but it really um, it kind of made me realise that you could actually do journalism as a career and so I left South Korea, came back and went to Darlington College and did the NCTJ course there, which is like a newspaper journalism course and lots of you know journalists do that before they go on a local paper and stuff. But I only ever wanted to do magazine pieces really, yeah. And what was your, you write again about your kind of entry into the magazine market and then you know perhaps your, your disillusion with it? disillusion went with it later on. Could you talk about the first the first half of that, how you got to London and how you started? Yeah, well, I, I did. I loved magazines and uh, it was a magazine called Neon Magazine, which was a film magazine I used to love. Uh, you know, I always used to get the kind of Roy of the Rovers and stuff like that. And, and uh, GQ I really loved in the 90s as well. Um, so I, I, after college, after journalism college, I worked for a local magazine for a few months and then quit there, got the magic bus down. To London with all my stuff in a bag and uh, just started going around the streets. It was in the olden days, so I used to take your CV around to offices, you know, drop your CV off, and it took about a month before I got a job at Construction News, which was a weekly construction magazine, uh, which was absolutely amazing. I worked there for a year, and these were like hard, it was just hard journalism, like proper reporting, trying to get scoops that nobody else had. Every week you would try and pitch your stories on to other publications, so you know, I got a couple of things in private eye off that and stuff. And, uh, it was like real reporting. Trade titles have been cited by a lot of very well-known journalists now as a really good way of getting into the industry. Yeah, it, it certainly was. I've no idea what it's like now. I think construction news, like most of the magazines I've ever worked for, probably, I don't think it exists in print anymore, I don't think. But um, so it was definitely a great way of getting down to London. And I think people do internships and stuff now, don't they? But then it was like, it was a good way of coming down to London. You had a job, you're going to learn how to be a, a reporter. And I wrote lots of features because that's what I wanted to do, B built my portfolio up. And it, it was part of EMAP, which I, I don't know if EMAP exists anymore either, but um, 
they also had Arena magazine. So right. yeah. basically, if you're in the publisher, you got you got an interview with a job that you applied to. So I played for a job at Arena as a staff writer and uh, got hired there. Well, I read a, a very funny anecdote about your interview process at right. Arena, where you said that you said it went very badly, the interview. Yeah. And so you took a punt on, you emailed the two interview interviewers yeah. and did a kind of like mock review of your interview in a yeah. very self-deprecating way. And it worked, because most people would advise against yeah, that. Yeah, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't know I'd written about that anywhere, actually. I can't remember that. But, um, I've done no, some thorough research. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was Will Stoll, um was a, the features editor there. And it was the deputy editor as well, whose name I can't remember, Paul something, and um, Paul Crowton. Uh, yeah, basically, I just went along. I, I, I was my usual nervous, kind of bumbling self, and uh, it didn't go very well. But then afterwards, I just thought, OK, I'm in London. The whole point was to write for a magazine that does proper features and stuff. So I really wanted that job, and it went badly. And it was just kind of like, yeah, smash, smash the emergency glass now, because that didn't go well. You're not going to get the job, so you've got to do something. So I sent this email just sort of, yeah taking the mickey out of myself, really, and uh, and I got off with the job. Did, uh, did, did, sorry, did you write it like an analysis in the third person, right? like a review of someone else watching? I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> but I, I know it was, it was really slagging off the way I had been, but it was a way to show them that actually I yeah. could write and the fact that I was aware that that didn't go particularly well, you know. So. Yeah. And where in the kind of long evolution of the British men's mag mm. was Arena when you were there? If you yeah. have sort of James Brown's loaded in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. And, and F, so I worked for FHM after Arena. Um, and FHM at some point had sold like a million copies or something like that. But yeah, yeah no, I arrived. <laughs> I arrived when it was all sinking. It was kind of, you what know. What year was that? Um, so Arena, it was like maybe 2006 or 2007 or something like okay. that. But it was, it was constantly struggling to sell copies, I think, yeah. and, you know, panicking about numbers sometimes, I think, and things like that. So, and I, so I worked there for like a year, and then they, I remember it, I got offered from Construction News, my news editor there came and said to me, do you want to, uh, do you want to come back to us? And they offered me like a good amount of money, much more than I was earning at Arena. So I went to the editor of Arena and said, look, I've been offered all this money, can I have a pay rise? Because, you know, try and play that. And, uh, and he went, no, you can't have a pay rise. And also, you are going to lose your job in a few months, so you might want to take that job. So I was like, oh, no. And they basically did a round of redundancies, and uh, I was laid off. That, but I got shipped across to FHM. So I never kind of applied to FHM, but it was like a, you know, a, a life raft for me. Yeah. And what was FHM like at that time? It was exactly the same as Arena. It was done. You know, it was kind of, it, it, they, they brought this guy, Anthony Nogueira, back, who'd been there during the kind of boom time. And they brought him back as editor to try and let's recapture some of those sales. And uh, so it was constantly trying to figure out, trying to figure out, but they, they were still putting pictures of women in bikinis and stuff on the front cover. And people just didn't want that anymore. You were know, there any want... women working on staff? Or was it all? Um, not on the editorial, I don't think, but on picture desk, subs desk, things like that, yeah. And what was the atmosphere like generally? It, it, like, Arena was brilliant because it was all these kind of really creative people. Uh, and uh, very interesting people, kind of people I hadn't come across before, up in Newcastle, and uh, and then FHM. It was it was great that p people have this impression of it because of what the magazine looks like and stuff. That it was kind of all these like kind of boorish lads, but everyone just people just wanted to be great writers and they wanted to be you know great picture editors and stuff like that. People wanted to do really good stuff, and you're kind of hamstrung by the publication that you're work working for a lot of the time. Um, but they were all alright. Yeah. What was the size of the team at that stage? Uh, there was probably like, you know, half a dozen people on staff who were kind of writing and stuff. A couple of, you know, a deputy editor, editor. Uh, on the picture desk, like three people or something like that. Okay. Yeah. And I've always been fascinated to know what would happen when you called someone for a story and said you were from FHM. Like, what was the, the reaction? <laughs> uh, people, I mean, a lot of the times it was like celebrity interviews and stuff. Yeah. So there was a, a particular person who was that it was their job to line those things up. Yeah. Uh, I think they had difficulty, particularly getting people for the cover and things. But writing a feature, so say, so like one of the features I did was um, going on, uh, spending a week with a search and rescue helicopters for the okay. RAF. 
And they loved it, you know. They yeah. it was, so all that sort of stuff. The kind of people that you targeted, they were really loving it because we were going to do six pages or eight pages about them and photographs. And they always loved the photographers come along, take pictures of us. You know, we look great. So it was it was fine. I never had any problems with it really. Were there yeah. any features you felt uncomfortable being asked to write or? No, they, like. What, how do you mean? What? Just in terms of it, how the style or, I mean, even GQ, if I look, because I used to work at GQ, mm. some of the um, the way the celebrities, especially female celebrities, are written about oh, in terms of the cover yeah. interviews. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, they would just never, they'd never be written like that. Yeah, no, now, no. It's very it's odd when you look back at the copy then. It was, it was, it was, yeah, particularly about the female cover stars and stuff like that. It was odd. Um, I, I always felt uncomfortable about all that stuff, and I felt uncomfortable. I, I never suited. It, FHM were great because they gave me a job, um, but I think I was always a bit of a, a thorn there because I just never felt comfortable with it. I didn't buy FHM ever. I wasn't, you know, a reader of it. So it was, I always felt like I want to be taken seriously as a journalist, you know. And so it was kind of hampered by that. But, but um, did you miss anything about that era of men's magazines? Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I, w I, was, I wasn't ever really bothered about those men's magazines, so I don't, I don't miss them. But everyone felt very uncomfortable. So Jeff Mace was, I was talking to Jeff Mace yesterday, and he used to work for Loaded. And I think some of us who worked for those men's magazines, we were very careful for a good few years afterwards about, so I wouldn't tell people I used to work for FHM mm -hmm. and things, because people made such assumptions about you. So if you're pitching stuff to a serious uh, editor, they, you know, they don't want someone who used to work for FHM, so you'd play that down. So, yeah, I definitely felt uncomfortable about the fact that I had worked for FHM, and I'd play that down and keep it. But now, I feel much better about it. I feel like, you know, I feel like sort of the stuff I've done has proved that I'm a decent writer, and um, so it do, it doesn't worry me so much. And, uh, and what was your route after the arena layoff? So arena went straight to FHM. I did like maybe two years as a staff writer then. And then they were looking for redundancies again. Uh, and how old are you at this time? Uh, 26 or 27, something like that. No, when I left FHME, I was 28. Um, they were looking for redundancies, and I didn't want to work there, really, um, uh, because I wanted to write for different publications. So I took redundancy from there and started pitching freelance stuff, yeah. And, that's, so, and, then, <laughs> and then I was trying to be a freelancer in London. And of course, I'd set up all these freelance, you know, uh, um, opportunities before I left. And it was like, oh, yeah, we're going to have this. And then they get a new editor in and then none of that freelance stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you can't earn a living. It was really hard. Um, and then I wrote about that for the Observer magazine, which is all about I've got no money. <laughs> it's yeah. really hard and a kind of boohoo piece. Um, and then you did a follow up to that. The, well, that follow up was like seven years later. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so that was in 2010 when I did the Observer piece, which it was like a cover feature, it was amazing actually, cover feature, and it was 4,000 words, commissioned and edited by Ian Tucker, who I think still works there, and, uh, and it was really great, it was, they, they paid good rates for the time, uh, and they gave me time to do it, and what were the rates then? seriously, I think it was 30p a word, but I was, it was like when I was first mm. doing freelance, and, and to be honest, the difference, a, a long piece compared to a short piece, so now, that was 4,000 words I was doing for 30p a word, um, and now it'd be like 2,000 words. So, And you still spend a lot of time on it, even mm. though it's only 2,000 compared to 4,000. That's what I think has made things very difficult for a lot of freelancers, is the, sh the short word count. And the difficulties of freelancing is something you've been very open about in mm. terms of financially and in terms of the mistrust you've had with editors. You've been <laughs> edited beyond recognition, you've said before. And oh, really? You felt God, where, where have I said that? God, I've read so many <laughs> interviews with you. Um, You've said, you definitely said it, you said okay. that there are some times you felt uncomfortable with your byline being on some pieces. Yeah, well, no, I, I mean, I definitely thought it. The, um, that Observer piece was great because Ian took a, he gave me a PDF of the piece and that was the first time that had happened. Gave me a PDF of it and said, this is what it's going to look like when it's published, are you happy with that? Yeah. And I approved of every single word and it was just great. And then, but then I was writing for some other magazines and stuff and they, and they were changing stuff and I wouldn't know about it until I saw, I didn't know to ask for PDFs at the time. I do, mm. now I always get PDFs of everything, but I didn't know to do that. So stuff would be published and it had my byline on it and there was just the most atrocious phrases in there, like clumsy, right? Some, at one place they changed my, one of my quotes um, to kind of ramp up the piece. And uh, I was so furious. So I, I stopped looking at stuff when it got published. I, I, I was 
when I was writing a whole feature that I'd spent like a month on or something, and it would come out, I I was I don't want to overblow it, but I felt very depressed for like a month or so, like really angry, frustrated at first, and then just depression because I just thought I've put all that into that, and then this has happened to it. It's something I can't now put on a website, or I don't want to. I don't want anyone to see it, and I know people have seen it and read it and thought that I wrote that, and I was trying to make. I was trying to establish my reputation as, a, as, a, as someone who could write decent stuff. And suddenly there's this stuff that I'm embarrassed of that I have to then tell people I didn't really write that. It is interesting it. that not, yeah, the not getting a playback culture. Because mm. again, it, I think it's a, maybe a US, UK thing that, you know, I'm, yeah, I've, I'd be horrified to write a magazine piece and not see the PDF. Because, you know, mm. for factual mistakes, it's, it's mm. as stuff like as stuff. Er, exactly. Errors were put, in, put yeah. into things. And it's like, and yeah, the most terrible thing was when they changed the quotes, and I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, "That is shocking." Yeah, th th who's going to get into trouble if if they complain about that? You know, is, is it going to be me? Is it going to be you? And, and how bad was the James? It was ramping it up, yeah. it, you know. But um, I, I can't remember exactly what it was now, but uh, exactly what the change was. But it basically ramped it up, and I just thought it was, it was really terrible. What um, you wrote very personally in that Observer piece about the kind of financial trials, and mm. you've also written. You sent a piece back any of vasectomy uh, later, <laughs> you know, written about this really kind of personal stuff. And mm. I'm wondering the, the kind of voice in those pieces, the sort of slight boohoo element. To what extent is that a voice, and to what extent is that is it just unadulterated Andrew? That's um, I th well, it is. It is my voice. I, it, I try and make. I, I guess I try and take the Mickey out of myself, mm. and. For example, like so, the, I did the observer piece in 2010, and then 2017, I followed it up with another piece saying, you know, I'm all right now because I, my mum had um, been made redundant by Northern Rock, so she had some money. She gave me some money to help with pay for a, a, house, a deposit for a house. So I was taken. I put that out there. You know, I chose to do that and to to kind of make the point that a lot of people are getting money from parents and stuff, and that's the only way that they can establish themselves. And I'm one of them. Uh, but there's a lot of people who aren't able to do that. Um, so deliberately making myself out to be that kind of person and then kind of lay it on thick, you know, I think I had a line in there which was like, you know, and then the shakedown began. As in, you know, I look like a money-grabbing, terrible son. Mm. So I'm deliberately making myself look as bad as possible, okay. I think, in those pieces. But then hopefully I redeem myself by sh showing people some nice side of me mm. as well. But I remember Suzanne Evans of UKIP, uh, or formerly of UKIP, uh, tweeted about that saying, and I'd written about my dad in the piece as well. And she was like, oh, his dad sounds like a good bloke, but he sounds horrible, you know? <laughs> and it was like, well, of course you think that. I wrote it that way. It's deliberately to, to make that happen, you know? So it's definitely kind of... I think self-deprecation is part of the protection when you write personally. I think a lot of personal writers yeah. do use that tone. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to use myself as an example to, to, to kind of hang myself as an example to say, like in that 2010 piece, I'd spent money on going on holiday. I had a framed picture from when I went on holiday. And then I'm saying, oh, I've got no money. And it's like, well, there's your money. It's mm. all around your room. You know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, I use myself um, as a kind of character to bash uh, in order to make a point. You know? How conscious uh, or varied stage of your career were you of being a northern writer in, um, you know, from a working class background uh, in a world yeah. that was sort of populated by posh southerners like, <laughs> like Ellie I'm and not, me. I'm not, I'm not working class. The, um, my my mum and dad were, but I, I grew up in a detached house and my, they had nice cars and stuff. And, okay. and then we, we, we they, my, my dad's, uh, <laughs> we, we kind of, they lost money. So then, you know, you, you don't have much money, but it doesn't really make me working class. So if someone in Newcastle heard you say I was working class, they would go, He's not working class, so I'm always careful about that. Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I come down to when I come down to London, yeah, it, I mean, it, as soon as I came down, it was, it was totally. Well, everyone just goes on about. I used to have a much stronger accent and stuff, so everyone goes on about your accent all the time and things. And then in in the media world, yeah, suddenly everyone seems to have gone to private school and things. So that's that was very peculiar, um, and. But then you start using it to your advantage, you know. I'm the, I'm the northern guy, I'm the guy from Newcastle, and you sort of play that up a bit. So so it's got benefits. But yeah, no, I mean, I'm still aware of it now. But I, I live in Newcastle again now. Well, I was going to say, how did you feel when you went home? Oh, it felt like a retreat. It was, uh, it was, I, so that, again, I just could not, my wife was pregnant, and I just could not afford to live in London and bring up a child there. So that's when I started working on the Ral Moat book. Um, it was in 2010, so he'd just done it a couple of months later. I was still struggling around for work, couldn't earn enough money, 
and I was like, she wanted to go back to the northeast because she's from there. She wanted to be in her family, and I said okay, and I started after the remote thing, looking to see if I could get access to that story. And once I realised I could get access to it, then I said okay, we can go back to the northeast. At least I'll have this book thing that I can do. Uh, did it, was it always conceived as a book, or did you at first think it could be a piece of long form? I always. Uh, no, I I always wanted to do it as a book, but I did try and pitch it around to like the Guardian and Sunday Times magazine as well. While I was working on it, I wanted to see if I could just get a feature going to you know bring in some mm. money and do further your research and stuff. But I could never get commissioned for it. So. Could you give just for maybe listeners who aren't familiar with the case a bit of context? About sure. So Ralmo um, was a guy in 2010. He'd been in prison for assaulting someone and uh, came out of prison and went and shot his ex-girlfriend. She didn't die, actually. Um, so he shot his ex-girlfriend, shot her new boyfriend. He did die. And then he went and shot a police officer who was blinded in it since uh, he since killed himself. And then Ralmo went off to the hills in Northumberland for like a week. And it was, I mean, it was the, it was the main news story for a week while he was hiding out there. People weren't sure where he was. It was on the front pages of all the papers. It was rolling news on Sky News and things like that. And then on the Friday night, he was surrounded. He, they found him. He was surrounded by police officers. And after six hours, six hours of negotiation, he shot himself. And was the idea that were you kind of looking for an idea for a book, or had you did this trigger the the idea? To no, I was looking around for an idea for a book. I, I when I was freelancing, um, I got very frustrated with the kind of pieces I could get commissioned, and I, I was I just. I was quite frustrated with what was being published by magazines and weekend supplements and things like that because I, I just wanted to try and do more experimental writing. Um, but obviously the kind of fashion at the moment is with that whole New, New Yorker type of writing. And uh, so, that it, it, you know, I was flogging a dead horse sort of thing. So I couldn't get things commissioned. Like I remember one piece that I pitched to the Sunday Times magazine, I think. I wanted to write a feature from the point of view of a horse where I'd go and spend like a week in the stables with like a, a horse who was going to compete in the Grand National and then follow them and be with them all the way through the Grand National and stuff. And obviously they were like, no. And, <laughs> <laughs> and in hindsight, it sounds ludicrous, but this is the sort of stuff I was trying to get commissioned. Um, and, I, and I was like, I really want, and I really, I tried getting second person stuff because the book's written in second person. I tried getting second person stuff commissioned and I couldn't anywhere. And I was like, I really want to do a feature in, uh, I want to do a big project in second person. I decided I'm not going to get it commissioned for a magazine, so I'll try and do it as a book. And then I was just waiting for something to come along which would fit with that. How so. big an influence was Bright Lights, Big City? It was a huge influence, yeah. The, the uh, Jay McInerney novel that's written in the second person. Yeah, and I, I loved that book. And that's exactly, that, I mean, that was where I got the idea for doing second person. I thought he's done it in fiction. I thought it worked really, really well. Um, and I just thought, can I apply that to non-fiction? Yeah. It is such a hard style to pull off though and can be quite jarring. I mean, you do it brilliantly, but done wrongly, it can be quite jarring for the reader to read. Yeah, people say that. I, just, I, I don't think I've read bad examples of it, so... I'm sure they just don't get published. Well, yeah, maybe, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so I, I, once, once you've started writing from that point of view, it's quite easy. And this book's kind of a simple book because it's all from the point of view of Ralmo. So it's so constrained, you don't need to worry about any of that side stuff. Mm. You just stick in his head and it's just, you did this, you did that. And once you started that rhythm, it's, it's, it's quite easy to write, I think. And uh, yeah, you might clunk it up every now and then and hopefully fix it before, before it gets published. But, um, but yeah, it's, it, I, people yeah, go on about it being a really difficult kind of point of view, but I, I, I don't know if it is. I think maybe people just don't try it very often. Yeah, I think so. So how did you go about getting in his head? What was your reporting? So tactic? when I was down in London, I got in touch with his brother, um, Angus Moat, um, who hadn't, didn't know him for 10 years, but was his brother and it sort of appeared in the news a couple of times since, um, talking about his brother. So I just got in contact with him and said, could I come and meet you? Um, and How easy was it getting that meeting? I got, uh, that was all right, because I got him through, someone had interviewed him for The Guardian for a long feature. I can't remember oh, the so reporter's name. To but, yeah, so, and I got in touch with her and I said, can I, um, can I uh, can I get his contact details? And she asked him if it was all right. I went and, and, and he said, yeah, I'll meet you. So we went and sat down in a cafe for like an hour and chatted and I explained what it was I wanted to do. Um, and he said, yeah, I've got this. And he, he'd, he, when Ralmo had died, 
Angus had been the one who'd gone to his flat with a couple of friends and they'd emptied out the flat. So they had whatever he'd left in the flat. So there was interesting stuff in there. So I knew and once, I'd, once, so, you know, it took many more meetings of, and we went hiking in Rothbury where Ralph Moat shot himself and things like this, because they used to go there when they were kids. So I spent a lot of time with him um, and, and I think he trusted me that I was going to do something worthwhile. So he allowed me access to lots of material which had been left in Ralph Moat's And flat. you tried to speak to Ralph's mother as well. Yeah, and she, she wouldn't speak to me. She'd spoken to a news reporter who'd written a piece about her while Ralph Moat was on the run. Right. Um, and I think, and yeah, I tried to speak to her, but she wouldn't speak to anyone after that. Yeah. And what in terms of documentary sources and things like that? So, yeah, so the, with, I got stuff from the flat from Angus and then I, and the biggest thing was lots of documents, um, which, <laughs> which I have to just be very careful about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but there are lots of, there were lots of documents which I used in there, which were the biggest source and the most important source. But I, just, I can't really kind of describe them or go into them too much. And then the other thing was his, Two accomplices, while he was on the run, he had these two friends with him who pretended that they'd been held hostage. Um, and they went to court, so it was like, I think it was like a six week trial. Um, and one of them got 20 years and one of them got 40 years. Um, so I spent, I, I was in that court for the whole time during that trial and just making lots of notes and noting what time, you know, this telephone call was made and what time this would happen. And they, you know, they revealed lots of information during that court process. And then, um, after that, there was also an inquest which went on for three weeks, I think it was. So there was also that where I could say that, you know, what happened during the negotiation? What was this person saying during the negotiations? Like and is it right that you only were able to get access to the court by doing a piece for the Huffington Post? Yeah. So because it was a huge, big story, the courtroom was packed and, um, you know, I, I was a freelancer. So they were only giving gave, giving access to accredited journalists, mm. which I which really annoys me because, it's you know, I suppose, you know, it's just the way that it has to work. But for freelancers, it makes it things very difficult if it's a busy court. So I got in touch with the Huffington Post and said, look, can I write a piece for you? And they said, yeah. So that gave me access. So I got my press accreditation from that. Yeah. And how concerned, I'm sure, as lots of journalists are when they're reporting on kind of court cases and deaths of mm. making sure everything was completely accurate. Was Angus at all trying to you know, get copy approval with anything? I mean, uh, no, he never asked for anything like that. Um, you must felt quite a lot of pressure. Yeah, huge pressure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it had to be, everything had to be correct, obviously. And then there's all the legal worries. And yeah, it was like, honest, for like a year of my life or something, over a year, it was horrendously stressful, really, really terrible. The, I remember my, I was reading through some legal documents one time and, uh, and it just, it's, it worried me so much. And my wife came in and I was sat on the bed with the laptop and, and I was just white as a sheet and she thought I was dead because <laughs> I just looked so, I was just gone totally white and I'd just been sat like that for three hours, just panicking because it was just sheer panic, especially when you're doing a book, it's so much mm. is on the author. Um, so I made, I, there's some things I knew from being a journalist and then there were some things like as soon as it becomes gets like things like family court and things it gets very difficult and complicated um and then also various documents that i had and things so we we, we went and saw a lawyer um but it was supposed to be published actually i think in 2000 in the end of 2015 or something we pulled it for about a year um, be, because I phoned up my publisher and I was just panicking so much and I just wanted to go back to the lawyers and just... Was your publisher concerned? No, because he, he, we'd already had gone to mm. the lawyer. And, mm. <laughs> and the Who lawyer were you worried about? Because he was dead. I mean, he wasn't going to sue, right? Yeah, he was dead. No, um, it, it was... It, I, <laughs> this is one of the problems when the book came out and I would be interviewed about it because of stuff I don't want to say and I don't want sure. to highlight because, and part of the reason why the book's written as it is, is to kind of um, mask over what the sources were and what documents are in there, because- so it's not footnoted or- No, or it's not footnotes and there's not an index. It's, 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 I tried to strip all that out, which I, this is one of the problems with it is that, so, you know, journalists will read it and go, oh, what, you know, where's this from? Is this, is this accurate? Is this true, you know? 
and and that's frustrating for me. I would love to like sit with all the documents and go, yeah, this is from there, this is from there, this is from there. But I can't do that. But no, so I, part of the reason I wrote it like it was was just to kind of cover over a little bit um, to sort of, so it wasn't so obvious what I had. And just go backtracking slightly, what was the process of getting the book deal and the agent and the publisher and so forth? Yeah, so, the, so I started writing in 2010 and then um, I, and at one point I was writing a book. I, I, I thought there's no way I can do this because I was so worried about what I had uh, in it being able to use it, whether I could use it. Um, I started writing a book called Not Writing a Book About Ral Note, which was just like, I was just like, yeah. and I got like a few thousand words into that. And then, but then what I did was um, submit like 5,000 words of it or something to this thing called the New, uh, Northern Writers Awards, which is like a, a thing, a, an award scheme for Northern writers mm. where they give you time to write money. Um, and I won one of those prizes, that was five grand, which was just amazing. And also they introduced you to agents and stuff. So I'd spent about two years on it and I'd kind of given up on it for a bit. And then once that happened, I was like, okay, that's going to get me to agents and I've got some money so I can do a bit more writing. And um, so I'm, then I met some agents, came down to London, they take you for a night out in London and you meet all these agents and it's kind of like a networking thing. And I got an agent from Green and Heaton um, and she was, she was so brilliant. She was a really great, great agent. And, uh, but she wanted a different book to the one I was trying to write. So when I was sending her the proposal, she was like, uh, could it, she wanted it to be like um, Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, is that the name of the book? I don't know. Um, so she wanted it to be like this other true crime book. And I was like, that's not really what I want to do. I want to do this second person. I want to do it like that. So, so she, she dropped me. Um, while I, was on, while I was in New York doing an, an assignment, I got the email. I was like, oh my God. How tempting was it to just go with what an agent was saying simply because you were under financial stress yeah. and you'd moved, you know, your wife was relying on you to yeah. write this book? Um, did you consider her? No, no, I just, I, I, I really, I had such good stuff, I thought. The, I just, I, I knew it would work as a book the way I wanted to do it. And I thought if I did it that way, it would, it, it would get it to the market quicker and it might have been commercial and things. But the whole, the whole point of writing this book was to try and establish myself as a particular kind of writer and to demonstrate because I'd felt so frustrated with having all these features out with your name on it that you hate. I thought this will be the thing that I can say, this is how I write, this is the kind of thing I can write and I'll look after every single word in it and it's mine. So to then do something that somebody else wanted to do, it would have just defeated the whole point, you know? So after your agent dumped you, how did yeah. you, what did you do then? So then I went back to this organisation in the North East called New Writing North, who run the Northern Writers Awards. I said to them, look, I haven't got an agent. Have you got any suggestions? They suggested another agent who was a good guy as well. He took it to, so I got a proposal. I'd worked on the proposal in the meantime. I sent it to him, which was the proposal as it ended up. And he liked it and he was really great. And he sent it to the big publishers. Um, and Simon and Schuster came back, I think, and they said, they said, oh, you, we think you could write some really great fiction. Um, would you like to write something fiction? And I didn't want to, I didn't want to write fiction because I'm a journalist. And uh, I think I went to Penguin and they said, they said something really nice. And the, the agent supported me, the email actually, and it was like, oh, we'll meet, I'll meet you at, I can't remember what it was, but like, I'll meet you at the Ivy and let's have a chat about it. And he forwarded me this, and I thought, oh, that sounds nice. But um, that was my agent meeting Penguin, I think it was. And then I just never heard anything back. And I, like, I waited like a couple of months there, I emailed my agent, I was like, did anything happen with that? And uh, I think he didn't respond. And then I waited another few months, I think I called, and he didn't respond. I left a voicemail message at the office, and there was just no response, and I sent a couple of emails, I was just like, and then it turns out he was quitting the industry to go and do something else. I think he was like becoming a state agent in America or something. But um, I really, I think he was. But he was really great. But it was just really, it, I was frustrated because I was like, he could have said, yeah. And and it was like they, you kind of got a good reaction from those ones. But maybe we can try the lower down ones now. Uh, and it, so I said to him, look, just send me a list of where you sent it. So he got in touch in the end, and I said, send you me a list of the ones that you sent it to, and let's just call it quits. And uh, so I did that. And then I just started sending it out to publishers myself. So I sent it to like Lee Braxton. And, and what, what were you sending? A proposal? Or proposal, yeah. yeah. So it was chapter breakdown, the page for each chapter, sample, it, I did the prologue as the sample chapter, and then a synopsis. And it was really, I'd worked on it, it was really punchy from the first sentence of the synopsis. It was like, bang, bang, bang. The chapter breakdowns were all written in second person. It was like, this is how it's going to be. Um, is the prologue in the book now the same as it was? It is, I mean, I've changed it a bit, but it's 
uh, I mean, the raw material was yeah. there. So the prologue in the book is uh, um, he, he was getting referred to a psychotherapist mm -hmm. and he was and he had a form, which is amazing that they do this. I think they don't do this in some places, but it was a form where it said, you know, what difficulties have you had in your family and stuff like this? And he's writing his answers on the form. So that's the prologue. Did he write in block capitals? Himself? Yeah. 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 Um, and They're quite funny, some of his answers. Oh, it's so heartbreaking, though. But um, for, for his family, for mm. his kids and stuff. But um, the... So, yeah, no, I did the prologue, and it's pretty much as it was, and sent that to Lee Braxton at Faber. They, I, and he was really nice, and I thought, oh, this is great. Um, and there's a couple of other people. And in the end, it went to Philip Gwynne Jones. I think a friend of mine, um, Justin Quirk, had been talking to him about some writing stuff. And this guy, Philip Gwynne Jones, who now is the um, publisher in chief, I think, at this publisher called Scribe, who published it, he read through the proposal, emailed it to him, read through the proposal, and then came back and said, I really like this. Do you want to have a conversation? So, and that so was you, it. You, it was sold without an agent? Yeah. 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 And in terms of the tone of the book, now I don't know if this is just me, but. Mm -hmm. um, particularly when you're describing when Rolls with his accomplices and they're hiding and they're kind of in the tent and yeah. they're, they're being held hostage. There is a certain humour in, yeah. in, the, in the tone. I mean, there, the way Rolls speaks is quite the, the way they're analysing their breakfast that they're cooking. You mm. know, you can't help but find some of the parts, some of the book funny in tone. Mm. Was that intentional and, oh, I, yeah. and I suppose it, it's quite disturbing because you actually, because if someone's funny, you tend to warm to them. That's just mm. kind of how humour works. So there's this odd, as a reader, you feel kind of, you know, you find him quite compelling and quite funny and therefore you slightly warm to him, but then obviously he's highly disturbed. Well, I mean, yeah, that is it's deliberate. It's mm. kind of not, it's, it's, I never thought of it maybe as like funny, but just absurd. Like, yeah. so when they were around, so his two friends were with him pretending to be hostages and they'd go off to the supermarket so they were camping out and everyone has this impression of Ralmo and his friends were camping out in the middle of nowhere but for a time they were just camping out around the back of an industrial estate just in a field and there were walk people walking past and stuff like this mm. and and then he'd send his mates out they'd go to Sainsbury's or I think it was Sainsbury's and buy um Reggae, reggae sauce and things like that. So when you when you hear those details yeah. in the courtroom, you're like, what premium sausages and well. all those sort of things. And it was just what you you know, he just shot people. You know, mm. someone's dead. Three people have been shot, and now he's you're buying barbecue sauce and things. It was just so bizarre, and just kind of revealed quite a lot about him and his friends. These two guys, I think, as well. Where it, and so I deliberately put that in there, which is it isn't to make light of any of it. It was. It was in order to, um, uh, you know, juxtaposition that with this horrific violence and this guy who'd done these terrible crimes. It, it's kind of like showing, are you really, you know, are you really having a barbecue mm. at this mm. point in time? Um, but then, of course, there was a controversy with some people thinking, a, a small fraction of people, but yeah. thinking that it was sympathising with, well, how oh, did Well, no, it's, I mean, I, I tried to create empathy deliberately, yeah. yeah. Um, because... I mean, the title of the book is You Could Do Something Amazing With Your Life. And that's something he said. He said, I could do something amazing with my life if it wasn't for. So I what, what I wanted to do, there was a lot of sympathy for him when it happened amongst some people. There was also the people who thought he was a hero, but there was mm. sympathy among the left. There were flowers you know. left at his yeah. house. Maybe. Well, there's that stuff, yeah. but, but, but more like, so I was living in London when it happened and talked to people on the left and they were very much, you know, Oh, but he must have had a terrible life. He must have had this terrible upbringing. And then you talk to people on the right, and they were like, like David Cameron, who said, you know, he's a murderer, full top, end, full stop, end of story. So I was interested in that. It's like, how much is he to blame for his own decisions? You know. So I was, I was taking that title. I could do something amazing with my life, and I was trying to hold into account, like, okay, bad things might have happened to you, but you still decided to shoot three people and ruin all of these lives. So at what point are you not accountable for your actions? And it was just trying to hold into account for his own actions all the way through the book. And so you, you didn't do the Gaza intervention, which is some no. kind of the best known bit about the case in some ways. Yeah, that's what everyone says when you say, oh, I wrote a book about Ralmo, they say, oh, have you got Gaza in there? Because that was a great bit. Yeah. And no, he's not in there. Um, Can you just explain what Gaza did? Oh, yeah, so Gaza, so I, I can't remember which night it was. Well, it must have been the Friday night because that's when they found it. But, um, yeah, Gaza turned up, and Gaza's, Gaza's a Geordie, uh, and he said he knew who Ralmo was, um, and he might have met him on the doors and things like this, but um, 
I, th I, 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 he's done interviews since. I think he was taking drugs at the time, maybe drinking, and he tried to get through. He, he wanted to get past the police and get down to where Ralmo was in his armed standoff to try and talk him down. And I think he turned up with chicken and things like this. And uh, it's, so people are really interested in that because it's like the, you know this farcical side. But no, I didn't mention that at all in the book. And that's kind of that was one of the deliberate setting out my stall because the whole point of it is it's constrained writing. It's all within the head of Ralmo. And Ralmo did not know that Gaza was there. Mm. He didn't know anything about that. So if I put that in there, if it's it, you know it would have destroyed the whole book. You know? And it seems interesting that you know the standoff at the end was him threatening to kill himself. Yeah. Right. Which seems in a, in a I suppose we there's so much discussion about police violence and stuff mm -hmm. these days. I mean, was that a, how do you think the police kind of handled that? Um, you know, you could argue that like a less sympathetic policing establishment would have just shot him. Shot yeah. him. Well, I, I always thought that it w is. Yeah, he ended up dead, but he had. He'd already shot three people, including shooting a police officer, and then you go and stand on a riverbank with a, with a gun. If you end up dead, you know, that's kind of like tough luck, is the brutal way to put it. But one of the reasons I wanted to write the book as well was that, you know, he said that there was a police conspiracy against him. He said there was this conspiracy among social services. He said all these people were working against him. And then he ends up shot, and it's, it's not filmed by anyone. It's not on the audio because the negotiator's dictaphone ran out of batteries before Ralmo shot himself. They didn't film it. So it's like this guy died surrounded by armed police um, and he said there'd been a conspiracy against him. So I thought that is worth investigating mm. as a journalist, you know. As much as like the tabloid thing was this guy was terrible, he's bad. I thought, oh, well, we should at least try and definitely find out how he died and what was going on there. Um, so I was looking to see if there was some kind of, you know, uh, corruption or anything like that, and I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. The, p the police did make some mistakes, but, you know, some people, some people suggested that the police had shot him and things like this, but there was no, he, they didn't. What he did was shoot himself, but it was after they'd fired these shotgun tasers. They weren't, some guy who used to be in the police force who now sold tasers, he drove up from somewhere further down south, I can't remember, the Midlands or the Yorkshire or something, he drove up to the standoff and said, open up his boot and gave them these shotgun tasers, which instead of being attached by a wire, they fire like a, a shell. And two of those was, were fired at Ralmo just before he shot himself. Um, so they were trying to figure out whether that whether they connected and had some kind of muscle contraction caused them to shoot himself or whether it scared him and that's why he shot himself. So. Well, look, we're coming to the end of our time, Andrew, but look, thank you for... Oh, um, no, I was just going to ask if Angus or his mother read read the book. And if you I had no idea if his, if uh, Raoul and Angus's mum read the book. I don't know at all. But um, Angus did read the book because I sent a copy to him because I wanted to make sure that he... Well, I said to him, look, have a read of it and I'm available to discuss it at any time because mm. it was quite all very stressful for him, I think. Um, and I wanted to... I didn't want that to be you know, going around in the background of uh, wondering if Angus is stewing over something, if he's worried about it, if he's angry about it. So I just uh, kind of um, nipped in the bud, sent him a copy, he read it, and then we met up for coffee afterwards and discussed it. And, and he was all right. He was OK with it, yeah. Great. Well, look, thanks for being such a fascinating and candid guest and wishing you all the best for your projects going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. So, Simon, how did you think that uh, live recording went with Andrew? I found it really interesting. Um, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, his book is clearly fascinating and also structurally very innovative. It's written in the second person, and he, he really fought some battles to get that in there. I just thought it was interesting to discuss his kind of love-hate affair with more conventional journalism yeah. as well. Yeah, it was. It felt like he'd not had the best experience of as a freelancer and... He was clearly very frustrated with the industry um, and it was nice, well it wasn't nice, it was sad but um, illuminating to hear about the problems with editing and when an editor kind of um, gambles with your trust and kind of, you know, redoes your piece without your consent, you know, that's clearly an issue um, still going on. I'm still um, reeling from technical details of his vasectomy, which were in oh, one yes. of the pieces he sent. Um, but anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Acom. 
And me, Eleanor Halls. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Zara Hankier handles our social media. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to find us on social media, we're on Always Take Notes on Instagram, Take Notes Always on Twitter, and we'd really appreciate it if you enjoyed the episode, if you uh, subscribed to the podcast on iTunes and left a review. And contributed to our crowdfunding on Patreon at Always Take Notes. Anyway, that's all from us. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week. 